Welcome, welcome. My name is Anna Muhammad. I am the Equity Director and Food Access Coordinator for NOFA Mass. Uh, I live and do my work in Springfield, Massachusetts, which was formerly Pocumtuck land, which started at Enfield and goes all the way up to Deerfield. So I'm out here in Western Mass. And I am joined today uh, on the controls, my co-host is Rafi. So if you have any questions, if you have any technical issues in the background, uh, feel free to use the chat feature. We'll talk more about that in a minute and either Rafi or myself can assist you. So Rafi is the co-pilot today. Um, our session, as you can see, we'll be dealing with honeybee hives for community gardens with Mel Gad. Uh, it's gonna be a fabulous workshop and I've spoken to Mel a little bit before everyone logged in and saw a part of his presentation. So I'm so, so excited uh, to, to bring him on. But before we do that, we just have a few housekeeping things we wanna go through. So as I mentioned, we are, um, uh, I'm broadcasting from the Pecumtuck land. We wanted to point out that our racial equity statement is a living document and it drives the work that we do. We understand and acknowledge the harm that uh, white supremacy and racism has caused people of color in the uh, food and agricultural system. And it is our desire and our hope and our work um, to work to eradicate that together. And therefore we're asking all of our conference participants and members uh, to act as allies or accomplices to BIPOC-led organizations and communities. And we'll give you a few ways that you can help do that. You can provide resources to on the ground BIPOC-led communities that are working to provide food in their communities during this horrible pandemic. And uh, some of the organizations, examples of those organizations, Gardening the Community in Springfield, Sprout Change in Worcester, Mass or the Urban Farming Institute in the Boston area, Oasis on Blue in the Boston area. If you can reach out to organizations in your area to assist them in doing that. Uh, we can work on our own personal bias by joining Food Solutions New England 21 Day Racial Equity Challenge. That's one way that you can be a partner. We'll put that uh, website in the chat for your use. And then support uh, the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda. Uh, that's uh, mainindigenousagenda.org. We'll put that in the chat as well. So please um, consider these things. We know that if we work together, if we um, strive to put our resources together, then we really can feed everyone in the Commonwealth. We also want folks to take a look at the map and you see the, the link there, uh, the native-land.ca so that we can acknowledge that we are on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. So during the course of this workshop, just during the course of the day, consult that link so that you can find out exactly what it, it part of our indigenous family actually were in these lands that we live in today. We'd like to take this time also to thank our wonderful, wonderful sponsors that sponsored this uh, conference and a lot of our programming. Um, you're looking at our gold sponsors now, Ameriprise, Certified Humane, Farm Credit East, Fedco Seeds. Please go to the program book. Uh, you can click on the icon to go to the website and purchase something from them. Now you're looking at our silver sponsors, Black Earth Compost, Chelsea Green Publishing, a lot of great books from there. Wegmans, uh, Agrodynamics. Again, go to the websites, do business with them. They kindly and graciously support the NOFA Winter Conference. Um, also, and we'll put this in the chat, the link to our virtual vendors. It is in your uh, program book, your, your electronic program book, but please visit with them. Uh, you may get some discounts. A lot of times the vendors will put discounts in for conference goers. So definitely visit with our vendors. And then lastly, um, we have our virtual online auction, and they've got some great items on that auction. You want to check that out. Uh, there are a couple of bidding uh, situations going on that are quite fun. Uh, all the proceeds do go toward NOFA Mass continued policy advocacy work and education programming that goes on that we do throughout the state. So please check that out. It will stay open until 530 this evening. So um, with no more, 
from myself. I think we have covered all of our housekeeping. I do not want to delay. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us on this beautiful Sunday morning. I hope it's, it's pretty in your part of the state. I want to bring on without any further delay, uh, Mel Gadd. Mel Gadd is a beekeeper for 16 years. He is with the Mass Beekeepers Association and the, Ma the Mass Audubon Drumline Farm Beekeepers. So please, without any further ado, let us welcome Mel Gadd, who has presented with us before. And Mel, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm glad to be here. So um, I've been a beekeeper for almost 16 years. Um, I've been running a major beekeeping program at Mass Audubon Drumlin Farm and Wildlife Sanctuary in Lincoln, Mass. Um, where we now are running something like 17 hives across the property. Um, Drumlin Farm, for those who don't know it, uh, is about 250 acres, of which I would say a little over 120 acres are a working farm. Um, it's not organic, but it is sustainable. Uh, no chemicals are used on the farm. Um, we started a program roughly five or six years ago um, and have continued to expand it. Um, and this year we will be expanding our beekeeping activities to three additional uh, sanctuaries within the Metro West area around Boston. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about adding honeybee hives to community gardens, um, which uh, we've been kind of pushing people in the Boston area to do, um, and hopefully this will help you. Um, this presentation is post, will be posted on the website so that if people want to download it later, they can, especially because at the end there are some resources and lists of different organizations that you can contact. So everybody knows what a community garden is, um, so I don't think I really need to explain that. This is just an outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to go over some overall summary and goals. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of honeybees and native bees for pollination um, and give a couple of examples. One, our experience at Drumlin, one at a community garden at a church in Lincoln uh, that we set up some hives a couple of years ago, and a negative, unfortunately, experience of the Newton Community Garden Project where bees were removed and what that impact was. And I'm gonna go through kind of like a, I hate to say it this way, but a 12 step process for setting up a program, all the things you really need to consider. And then I'll talk about the cost for setting up a program, including initial setup, continuing costs and potential income that can be produced. And then I'm gonna talk about the, the largest part of the presentation will be what I call location, 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 about where to set up your hives and how to. Um, in the appendix is a liability waiver, which I'll talk about, and then a list of resources, okay? Um, people, if they have questions as I'm going along are welcome to put it into the chat and the moderators will let me know instead of waiting until the end, but I also will open it up at the end. Uh, this is me <laughs> with a package of bees that we use to set up hives at times. Um, that's a three pound package uh, that some people get through the mail or through local suppliers within the different region. That in that package are 10,000 bees uh, and a queen that we use to set up the hives. Okay. So community gardens have become very popular um, in our communities. It's a way for producing healthier food um, and helping to work towards securing our food security. Um, the number of community gardens within urban areas has dramatically increased in the last 10 years. And each community garden has made a small but significant contribution to the health, diversity, and sustainable of our sustainability of our food system. Um, the goal of this talk is to encourage community gardens to add a feature that will increase the output of the garden 
as well as help with a major environmental increase issue, the decrease of pollinators in our communities, which I know most people have heard about. And I have actually talked about it different talks from NOFA summer and winter conferences. Um, adding a beehive to the community gardens will accomplish a number of goals. Uh, one, it will help to increase the, the amount of vegetables produced and the quality of the plants grown in the garden. Um, and it will also help to increase the number of pollinators in our environment, which has become a very serious problem as we deal with the problems of chemicals in our environment and the, the major impact of climate change. Um, so hopefully this will give you, everybody a step-by-step -step process for adding bees to their gardens and show why this is a very worthwhile project to implement. Um, there are a lot of pictures in dispersed since I think pictures are worth a thousand words. This is a honeybee um, on a plant. And if you look closely at its head, it has what it, we call a proboscis, which is it's kind of like a tongue straw and it's soaking up the, the nectar from the flower. Flowers produce nectar for one reason and one reason only, to encourage the pollinators, honeybees, native bees, and other pollinators to come to them so that they will collect pollen and help to inseminate other flowers so that they'll grow um, vegetables, fruits, whatever. Uh, and if you look at this, but this bee, you can see little flakes or little dots of yellow. That's the pollen that that bee is collecting at the same time. Okay. So, pollinators play a major role in agriculture. Um, if whether it's a farm, backyard, or community garden, without the pollinators, we'd be in major trouble. 30 to 40% of vegetable and food crop, fruit crops are totally dependent upon the pollinators. And when I use pollinators, I'm, also, I'm talking about honeybees, native bees, and all the other pollinators that are out there. Honeybees are not native to our country. Honeybees are the original immigrants to the country that were brought over by the pilgrims. Sometimes it's hard to believe that back then they brought beehives over on ships, but they did. Um, native bees such as uh, bumblebees and a whole series of others, there are over 5,000 different types of native bees in this country. Honeybees are the largest number of bees and they're the only ones that beekeepers are able to manage. Um, so they become the major source for moving around to farms and for pollinating gardens. Native bees are actually better pollinators than honeybees because most of them are specialists. Like doctors are specialists, native bees are specialists. So there's a bee called the blueberry bee. It only pollinates blueberries um, and they pollinate at a rate of 80 to 90 percent where honeybees are kind of generalist and they will pollinate at a lower rate but again, because of being able to manage them, uh, they turn out to be the larger number of bees out there. Um, though at Drumlin and in Mass Audubon, we're also working to try and encourage the growth of native bees. Um, things like getting people to stop clearing up all the, the leaves that fall in the fall. Uh, native bees often will make their nests for the winter in rotting leaves on the ground. And when people do this total cleanup of their yards, basically what they're doing is they're deleting basically breeding grounds for a lot of the native bees. Um, but I'm, I'm, I don't wanna spend too much time on that. Um, pollinators also are responsible for roughly 80% of the pollination of flowers that keep them going. <clears throat> So, and I'm, now I'm gonna talk about some examples of what pollinators have done for farms and community gardens. When we started 
our program at Mass Audubon Drumlin Farm. Um, over six years, we have been documenting what has happened with respect to the pollination and the output of the farm. Um, I actually had given a talk at NOFA before about encouraging small scale organic farmers to start beekeeping programs as a way to increase the output and the quality of what they produce. Um, in six years, we've documented that the output, saying everything else is equal, saying the weather is the same, things like that, even though at times we do get impacted by the weather, um, the output on the farm has increased an average of 20% since we started the program. Um, so that's a major impact for the farm and a major positive force of putting, bringing, reason for bringing in um, honeybees. Uh, this is just a, a community garden. I can't remember where this particular one is. Um, the, second ex the second experience in using one of a actual community garden project, um, there is a First Church of Lincoln where some of the members have been for the have been running a community garden for the last number of years and a large portion of the food they produce is donated to different food programs within the region. <clears throat> I got asked a couple of years ago if I would be willing to put a beehive in the garden, um, which we did um, and it's been running now for two plus years and the quality and the amount of output from the garden has definitely increased based on what the members have told us. Um, another example of the negative impact of removing bees um, is there's a pretty long running community garden project in Newton sponsored by the city called the Newton Community Garden Project. And at one point they had a beekeeper years ago who used to keep bees on the property. Um, and during that period, the output on the farm drastically increased and the quality of the produce, produce in, was better. Um, but then the person either left the state or whatever, but they, they no longer had bees. Um, and I was out there meeting with them, just talking about their program. And what they were showing me um, is that one, there was a definite decrease in the output of the farm once the bees were gone and the quality of some of the produce decreased. And one of the examples they gave us was the size and quality of squash that was produced. Um, that the squash that particular year um, was dramatically smaller um, and not as tasty as when there were bees on the property. So I use that as an example to show the bees and the other pollinators definitely will increase your output and quality of, oops, of the produce that comes in the garden. Okay. So steps to starting a community garden program, uh, beekeeping program. Um, and this is just a summary of the steps that you need to follow and some of the concerns that you need to take. First one is make sure there's sufficient interest among your garden members. And different groups use different uh, uh, methods for communicating with their members and for selecting their members in the garden. Whatever it is, they should survey the, mem the group and ask about the interest among members to basically bring a beehive into the garden and whoever would like to learn how to keep and maintain the bees. Um, if people decide to go ahead with the project, which I'd be very surprised if they didn't, um, members need to, and I believe most community garden projects have a liability waiver that people have to sign. If you don't, they should probably look into that. Um, but attached to this presentation is an appendix with an additional liability waiver related to putting bees into the garden. 
Um, so people should really consider doing that. Um, second point is to get a local buy-in. Communicate with the neighbors. Some gardens are in neighborhoods. You know, it's an empty lot with buildings on all sides. Some gardens are on public lands. Um, doesn't matter what it is, you need to let the neighbors know that this is what you would like to do. Good communication with neighbors usually will get you the support. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, experience tells us that education about honeybees and the other pollinators goes a long way in relieving fears that people have about honeybees. Honeybees get blamed often for people getting stung. And the reality is honeybees are rarely the ones stinging people. Honeybees will only sting you if they're threatened. And threatening me it can be anything from doing some harm to the hive or waving your arms to get them away from you. Um, otherwise, they're not gonna sting you. If they sting you, they die but they will sacrifice their life to protect their family, their members in their hive. Um, in six years out at Drumlin, we've only had one person stung and that's because the bee got stuck in her hair and she tried to get it out. Otherwise, we have not had any incidents out at the farm. Um, education is a major issue that people once they understand that bees really are not the ones singing them, that it's more likely wasps and yellow jackets and hornets, that they really will start to support programs. Um, there's a lot of great educational material out there. Some of it's listed in the, in the resource list that I include in the presentation. Um, and you can get a lot of information from the state, MDAR, which is the Mass Department of Agriculture, has a lot of written information that can be used to help educate people. The other one you need to get a, approval from is the owner of the garden land, whether that's a public entity or a private entity to allow you to establish a honeybee hive. Now, some cities and towns have regulations related to installing beehives, and you will need to research that and find out whether or not, or what the procedures are. Now, most of the towns that I know of that require some kind of a process only require you to register that you have a hive and meet some minimal standards about placement. Some towns, and unfortunately, the town that I lived in for almost 50 years, Cambridge, Mass, has adopted a program that requires you to go through a whole hearing process um, to be able to place a hive in your yard or in a community garden or at a school. Um, a number of us who have been beekeepers for a long time and are active in the education community about beekeeping, try to convince them to do it like a dog license. Issue the license. If there's a problem, have a hearing. But of course, Cambridge in its inimitable style decided not to do that to start this whole process, which has discouraged many people from putting hives in their backyards because they don't want to spend the money and go through the process. Now, I, I heard this morning when we were before the program started that Springfield doesn't allow honeybees. Um, and that really needs to hopefully change uh, in a lot of communities. But again, there aren't that many communities that will not allow you to do it. You just need to check and go through the process, okay? All right, um, some of the pictures are, are pictures of different types of hives. One of the things at Drumlin that we do is we experiment with a lot of different alternative beekeeping approaches. This happens to be called a wari hive. 
Um, it works with the bar. It replicates what bees will do in the, in the wild. Um, and so we have a number of these out at the farm besides regular Langstroth hives and some others. Um, all right, number three, members need, there are two options for doing bees at a community garden. Uh, and members need to decide how they want to operate the program themselves, or if they want to find a local beekeeper who's willing to place a hive in your garden. If you decide to find a beekeeper to set up the hive in your garden, every county in Massachusetts has a beekeeping association. Um, and it's contacting them and putting the word out that your garden group would like to add a hive to their garden. Trust me, any beekeeper that gets a call saying, would you like to add a hive to my garden, will jump at the chance to do it. Um, and they also will be glad to mentor people and teach them about honeybees so that eventually the members in the community garden group can really do it themselves. Um, generally, if a beekeeper puts his hives there and what I do with the people from First Church in Lincoln is I will split the honey that's produced with the members of the community garden. Um, and this year was our first year that we were able to really split the amount of honey that we brought in. Um, you also should check, you might be surprised that someone in your community garden group may already be a beekeeper and they would be glad to move a hive into your garden. You can see the bee on this uh, allium plant. If people decide to set up and run the program themselves, it's recommended that those members who are interested try and take a beekeeping class. Um, included at the end of this is a list of all the bee school locations in the state. Again, ev almost every local county beekeeping group runs a beekeeping school. Um, and so that's, that's listed on here. Um, I run a bee school at Drumlin Farm. Uh, we used to do it on site. Right now, obviously, because of the pandemic, we're doing it online. Um, and most bee schools that are being run are being done online. Uh, generally, there's a limit on the number of people that can be in the class. Uh, but because it's being done online, it's been opened up across the board to anybody who wants. There's no limitation. The only negative part about it is usually we will, I will, at least at my B school, we will do one or two classes in the field, um, actually working with a hive. Um, and that has not been possible. But hopefully, as the vaccines get spread out more and this pandemic kind of slows down a little bit, um, we might be able to start doing some further later on. Uh, activities out in the field, because no matter how much you show in the classroom, it's still, you learn a lot more when you actually are at the hive, okay? Number four is find a location for the hive in the garden or the adjacent to the site. Uh, and I'm, there's a whole section on what I call location, location. Five is you need to raise the funds to buy hives, the bees and equipment and order them. Again, if you're gonna do it yourselves. Six is find a beekeeper willing to mentor your group and help you get started. Seven, set up your hive in preparation for the bees to arrive. Most bee programs in, this, in our state start generally in April. Um, when bees from suppliers become available. And as the plants start to bloom, um, it really works. This happens to be a hive in, at one of the hives out at Drumlin, and you can just see the girls coming in and out. Um, eight is install the bees when they arrive and document the process. 
Um, I push documenting the whole process uh, as an important feature. Um, one, especially in a community garden where um, different people in the group are going to be working with the bees, it's important that it's documented what you might have done or seen at the time of your spending time in the hive. Nine is develop a schedule for hive checks, including who's going to do it and when. Ten is you need to decide how to handle the honey produced, whether it's going to just be distributed to the members of the community garden or you're going to put it up for sale. And I'm going to go through some numbers here. Uh, and 11 is capture the honey. And again, either distribute to the members or set up a selling program. And I'm going to repeat this again since I've already said it. Important issues to remember is keep a detailed diary of activities related to the hive. Keep the diary on site so other members, when they come in and they're going to work in the hive or do something at the hive, they can see what's been done previously. Document all the activities at the hive, including findings of any inspections you do and document any problems and solutions followed so future persons overseeing the hives have a detailed history. Again, I can't stress how important this is. Many people document what they do in their gardens every year um, and will learn from that about how to improve what they're doing in the garden. There's one of the, the girls and I say girls because 95% of the bees in a hive are female. It's a female dominated society. They're the ones out there foraging and bringing back nectar and pollen. Um, if you look at the, this is, happens to be a sunflower, which they love. Um, the yellow kind of pellet on its leg in the back, which is called a pollen basket, is pollen that the bee has collected, which you can see on its body that it kind of compresses. Pollen becomes the bee's protein source. They mix it with a little nectar or honey uh, and it turns into what they call bee bread. Honey becomes their, their um, <laughs> I'm blanking on the word, um, but it's another food source for them, okay? All right, this is a cost analysis. Uh, for setting up, bee yard etiquette, um, don't be afraid of the bees. Um, I'm convinced, as some people are convinced, that with dogs, if you act afraid, they act accordingly. I think it's the same thing with the bees. If I go out and work in my hive and I'm not acting afraid, they tend to be more gentle unless something else is going on. Um, don't swat because that is threatening to them. Um, and just act normal. Don't be afraid because again, honeybees will only sting if they feel threatened because if they sting, they die. And they don't really wanna die, especially since their lives are fairly short. Um, my analysis that I'm gonna run through with you covers a typical setup cost for a beekeeping program. And it's set and the projection is for one hive. So obviously if you wanted to do more, you, you can go through the numbers and double them. Um, the prices and equipment are based upon one particular supplier called Better Bee, uh, which is one of the better suppliers in our region. Um, and it's based on their most recent catalog. Um, I don't include labor costs because generally you're doing it yourself um, and it doesn't really take that much time. Uh, here's a beekeeper working in a hive with some protective clothing. Okay. Um, this analysis has assumed that you buy and purchase everything you need um, and that you're purchasing pre um, built equipment. You don't, there are ways to cut these initial outlays down. And obviously if a beekeeper decides to bring his hives in, there will be no setup costs. 
Um, you can buy high boxes and frames that are not assembled and put them together yourself. You can try and get stuff donated. I've gotten a number of things donated to Mass Audubon for our hives. Um, and one of the bigger items in here is a spinner for capturing honey. It's not really necessary to purchase one of these, um, especially if you only have one or two hives. Most county clubs have spinners for rental um, for a day or two so that you can spin it out. And there are other ways that you can learn to capture your honey without using a spinner, okay? Um, again, there's another bee and you can see some pollen on her back leg. One just interesting piece of information for people um, is one of the ways you can tell the difference between a honeybee and other pollinators and yellow jackets, wasps, and hornets, because not all honeybees have that yellow color. Some of them are darker color and often people will confuse them with yellow jackets, wasps, or hornets. Honeybees and other native bees have bent antenna. So if you're looking at a yellow jacket, that antenna would be straight. And generally they're much more shiny. Um, and again, if it's a honeybee, it's got a bent antenna. There are those of us who are on these swarm lists that people will call you and say, there are bees in my yard, can you come and get them? Um, generally, if people call you in the fall, it's generally not honeybees, it's generally yellow jackets looking for a place to set up their hive. Um, and I used to run out and go to capture them and then realize that was crazy because 98% of the time it was yellow jackets. So I now have people take pictures with their phone and send it to me. And I look at it and if I see it's a yellow jacket, I'll say, you can deal with that yourself through an exterminator or buying one of these bombs to get rid of them. Okay, um, I'm not gonna run through it. This basically spells out every possible item you would need to buy, be, including beekeeping equipment, bees themselves. There are a number of ways to get them. One is to buy a three pound package which when I started beekeeping almost 16 years ago, I was paying somewhere between 65 and $75 for a three pound package. This year, they're now up to $145. Um, and that's because the number of suppliers has decreased and the number of bees out there that they're raising have decreased. So that, and the demand is a little higher. You can also buy what they call a nuke which is a small five frame hive um, that generally comes a little later in the season that's already established that you can put into your hive. Um, protective equipment. Um, the only thing I definitely recommend for people um, is some kind of jacket and hood to protect their face and gloves. I tend not to use gloves anymore because I can't really work well with the gloves on. Um, and any beekeeper that tells you they never get stung is not telling you the truth. Um, so I do often get stung. I don't really care if I get stung in my hands. The only place I really care about is my face. Um, luckily, I don't seem to be allergic. Um, I don't want to kid you, if you get stung, it will hurt, but there are ways to deal with that. Um, and there are ways to ease the pain and ease the swelling. 1% of the population is seriously allergic to honeybees um, and bee stings or other insect stings. Most people who are seriously allergic know it and they carry an EpiPen. Um, if you don't know it and you get stung and you start to have trouble breathing, you need to get to a hospital right away. Um, but again, it's only 1% of the population. Um, 
So again, this goes through the equipment, the bees, protective gear, tools that you will need. And you don't really need that many tools and you can see they're fairly inexpensive. Again, another community garden. Um, testing equipment for some of the problems we have with our bees. And, and I, I'm not really gonna talk about that now, um, but if you go to a bee school or get a mentor, they will really teach you about that. Do we have problems with the bees? Yes, we do. I don't wanna kid anybody. Um, but we're not having as much of a problem as some of the bigger commercial beekeepers have who move their hives across the country um, and are not being exposed to the chemicals that a lot of the large farms use. Um, so harvesting equipment. And again, as I said earlier, a lot of this equipment can be borrowed and rented for a small fee. I think my club in Essex County rents their spinner for $15 a day, um, including a tank, a, a bottling tank and other things for extracting the honey. Um, bottles, if you're gonna bottle it, um, are fairly cheap. Um, some feeding supplies for different times a year and then labeling and things like that. So this really shows a bottom line of to get started of seven, almost $1,800. Um, again, this can be cut drastically, um, but to get initially started on your own, you really do need to raise some money to, to establish the program. Um, when I get through into location, I am gonna talk about, you do need to provide water sources, just like you need to water your plants. The bees need water. Um, Annual continuing expenses, um, this comes to a bottom line of 365. I carry replacement of the bees for every year, though that's not typical. Um, out of the six, let's say 16 hives at Drumlin, um, right as of right now, uh, I have only lost four of my hives for different reasons. Um, but often you can get through every year without losing your bees. Um, a repair fund to make repairs to your hives or hive. Um, feeding for early in the season and then annual bottles for bottling. Okay, so again, there are a number of options with respect to what to do with the honey. Um, in the honeybee hive. Obviously the easiest is to just split the amount of honey with all the members of the um, garden project. The section op second option is to sell the honey. Some gar community gardens will sell or donate their excess supplies or produce to food shelters or sell it. Um, or you can sell it through a hive, a, a honey stand or um, at a, uh, some of these programs where people are selling their produce um, and use any of the surplus to kind of maintain your community garden as a whole. Um, in a good year, a typical honeybee hive can produce approximately 180 pounds of honey. You need to leave roughly 80 pounds for the bees in the hive. Um, and then for them to eat and to get through the winter. Um, and that used to be 60 pounds, but because of climate change and some of the other issues, we're now telling people to leave more. And then you can use the balance for whatever, whether you're giving it out to your members or selling it. Mel, yeah. can we interject with a quick question? Oh, sure. Um, Keith asks, um, for your particular farm, the Drumlin, where you, where you work with the bees there, have you ever um, sold honey from there? If you have, are there different sizes? Drumlin, we collect all the honey or a lot of the honey at the farm and they sell it um, at the front entry of the stand. We sell eight ounce jars. 
Um, it's funny because that was going to be on the next slide. Oh, okay. All right. I'll let um, you go right into it. <laughs> um, so if you go to sell your honey in the metropolitan Boston area, um, the average price for an eight ounce star of honey is $10. Now this is obviously raw honey, which is the best honey you could buy. Um, so if you have 180 pounds that you're taking, that you get from the hive and you need to leave 80 pounds for them, you have 100 pounds of honey for sale. That translates into 208 ounce bottles. When you multiply 200 by $10 a bottle, that's $2,000. Um, and if you just use what the annual costs are to run your hive and deduct that, that means on average, you will have somewhere between $1,500 and $1,600 for maintaining your community garden. Now at Drumlin, because we have 16 hives, we raise a lot of money from honey sales that they use for programs. Um, so yeah, it's besides increasing the output on the farm, we also have the honey sales and those honey sales contribute a lot of money to the program. Um, now, some of that money is used to cover my costs because I get paid for working out there. Um, and the balance is used for other activities at the farm. So it's not just helping with the pollination of the garden, it also will generate some money. And that was one of the things I pushed in the talk I gave about small farms starting honeybee programs. Um, oops, all right. So the next big issue um, is locate, what I call location, location, location. You know, it's the real estate approach to honeybees. Um, the best location is what you're looking for. So this is an example, this picture is actually from England. Um, and this is a community garden that's located on the roof of a building. Um, and in Boston, there are a lot of hotels now that have honeybee hives on their roofs. Um, and the honey is used in the restaurants. Um, so, you know, you can put well, I think you can put community gardens anywhere, including on roofs and honeybees anywhere. All right. So bees can fly anywhere from two to five miles looking for nectar and pollen. They do best when they travel less uh, because they don't use up some of that nectar that they've collected um, for fuel. Um, so and if you're putting it right next to the garden, they're not going to go far. As long as you're planting, um, besides vegetables, you really need to do planting with some wildflowers and other things that allow a food source throughout the whole season um, on, on the, uh, for the garden and for the bees. So, um, Choosing a good location increases the chances for a strong productive colony. Um, you also need to consider the neighbors. Um, and some of the other things to keep in mind is as I talked before, any city or town or state regulation. Right now, the only real state regulation in Massachusetts is your hive has to be set up so that if an inspection came from the state came, they would have to be able to remove the frame from the hive to look at the, the frame and see how the bees are doing. Um, that created a small problem for us at Drumlin because some of our hives were set up with a more natural approach to beekeeping um, so that we were just using a bar. So we've kind of modified the design of the bar to allow if we need to pull it out of the hive, we can do that. Um, you need a site that's easily accessible. Um, again, close to sources of nectar and pollen and water. Um, that really shouldn't be an issue since you're putting it right in the garden. Oops. All right. 
This happens to be a hive that was set up in my own yard uh, at one point. This is a traditional Langstroth hive. And you can see sitting in front of it is a, what I call it's a chicken watering bottle. Um, besides pollen and nectar, bees need water. They need water for basically two things. One, for their own bodies, just like we do. And two, they use the water to cool the hive in the summer. Um, they basically will put water into the cells and flap their wings and create the, almost their own form of air conditioning to lower the temperature in the hive. The average temperature in the hive during the season is a little over 90 degrees. The queen needs 90 degrees plus to be able to lay her eggs and raise and for the eggs to develop. When it gets over 110, they will start to cool the hive down um, to control that. And they're very efficient at doing that. You need a well-drained area. Uh, you don't want to put your hive in an area that collects water or a low spot. Um, you want to make sure your hive is situated so that it gets the sunlight as early as possible. The quicker the hive heats up, and this is what I'm talking about really is more in the early season, in the, in the spring. Bees don't really go out when it's less than 57 to 50 degrees, um, or if it's over 100 degrees. They don't like the super hot weather just like we don't. Huh. Um, but the quicker the hive heats up, the quicker the foraging bees will go out and start bringing in pollen and nectar, okay? Um, and at times, if your hive is in a spot that doesn't heat up that quickly, um, and I've learned this the hard way, um, we had one or two hives located somewhere near the fields where the farm is, um, where the trees kept growing so quickly that when I first put them out, they were in, they were in direct sunlight early in the morning over, the, over a couple of years, those trees grew so much that my, the hives were shaded for a good portion of the morning hours and the bees basically left. They were not happy. Um, and so they did what they call absconded. When they're not happy within a, a location, they will leave in mass and go and find a new home somewhere. So you wanna make sure you get as much sunlight as early as possible. Um, gets them out and started. If you can also get afternoon shade, that's great, but that's not as important. Uh, wind breaks are needed to provide some protection from the cold, winter winds. Um, the thing about honeybees um, that, or the misconception that a lot of people have is they feel that when we have a really cold winter, we have a harder time getting our bees through the winter. And that when we have the winters like we've had the last couple of years that are relatively warm, that our bees do better. It's truly counterintuitive. When we have these warm winters, we have had more losses partially due to that weather than we do when the winters are really cold. The bees basically ball around the queen in the hive during the winter, and they don't come out unless it's above 50. And when they come out when it's above 50, it's usually for a bathroom run. Bees are very sanitary. They won't go to the bathroom in the hive. If they can't get out during the winter because they don't get any warm days, they will get dysentery and that will eventually kill your hive. Luckily in our region, that's never usually a problem. But these warmer days that we're having, like last winter in January, we had 60 degree days. It confuses the bees. They think it's spring. They fuel up by eating more of their winter stores and they fuel up with honey and fly out looking for plants, never find them and never make it back. Okay, so um, providing a good windbreak will help protect the hive for two, for two things. One, 
when whipping through the hive really disturbs them. And two, I band my hives because at times, even though I weight my hives down with heavy rocks, uh, sometimes those winds are so strong, like we had this winter, that it will just lift the hive up like it's balsa wood um, and dump it. Um, and also at times, depending on where your hives are, you get, and I hate to pick on teens, but we've had a couple of incidents out at the farm where teens were out in the fields in the, at nighttime enjoying a couple of beers and thought it would be fun to just knock over some hives. When you band them, at least the hive stays together and it's easy to just upright it. If they're not banded together, your stuff is gonna be, your hive is gonna be spread all over the place and you'll lose the hive. So I now band them. Um, bees orient, them, orient themselves to the location of the hive based on the location of the sun. And they're usually out of the hive from mid-morning to mid-afternoon. Um, so you want to try and avoid placing hives on the west or north sides of your site. Uh, if there are buildings adjacent to your garden, you want to try and avoid putting them there unless they get early morning sun. Um, and you want to orient the hive to the south or the southeast. Okay. These are, this is just, uh, there are a number of pictures that show different locations of hives. This happens to be a series of hives on a site that's fairly rocky. Again, it, the access is harder for you, but it works for the bees. Um, you want to locate your hives in a location that makes it easier for you to carry them so that when you're capturing honey and you're capturing those boxes, those boxes can weigh, based on the size, can weigh anywhere from 40 pounds to 80 pounds. Um, so you want to make sure that it's an easy location to get to. Um, you want to locate your hives away from sidewalks or, or walking paths um, so that, and if you need to put them near there, you're gonna wanna put some kind of barrier or fence in front of them to push the bees up because you don't want the bees flying out at basically the average height of a person into people. Um, so you wanna push them up so that they go up and over the sidewalks or walking paths, all right? Uh, I wouldn't put it near a large river, um, especially if they need to cross that river to access sources. But again, that for most community gardens, that's not gonna be an issue. Um, and you, at times, depending upon where you are, you may wanna protect your hives with some fencing. Um, an example is we had a hive in the kids' garden at Drumlin when we first started. Uh, and two days later, after we had put bees in, the hive was knocked over. Uh, and it happened to have been adjacent to the goat yard. And someone said, oh, well, the goats knocked them over. And when the, the person in charge of the farm animals and I met, we agreed that it wasn't the goats, it was hands that pushed it over. So we now have that hive fenced in so people can't get to it. Um, and you wanna have, I've set up in areas that have minimal, minimal exposure to pesticides um, and stay away from deep shaded areas. Again, these are three different types of hives. The yellow one is a Langstroth. Uh, the beige colored one or cream colored one to the left is called a Wari hive, which is a more natural approach. And the one in the back with the black cover uh, is called a top bar hive which is prevalent often in Africa, um, but is gaining some momentum in, in our region. Now, we have uh, another question that came through if you wanna take it. Sure. Um, Keith uh, has asked again uh, on predators, um, are, do bees have natural predators? Yes, okay. Um, so 
The predators that you need to watch for, and this is a perfect slide to, prove, to show that in our region, um, besides people or kids or teenagers who think they're having fun, um, raccoons, skunks like to eat the bees. Um, and my, my experience with skunks in this particular, so these two particular hives, as you'll notice, they're up at least 16 inches off the ground. My neighbor had a family of skunks living underneath its porch. They used to come, the babies used to come into our yard and stand under the bird feeders to get the seeds. And then they discovered the hives. Well, when the bee, when the skunks stood up um, to get to the entrance, um, the bees attacked their stomachs. All you need is one case of the bees attacking the, the skunk or the raccoon stomach and they won't come back. Um, those are the biggest predators around here. Now, since we're talking about people all over mass, bears have become a bigger problem in certain parts of the state. Um, Concord, I had a couple of students from Concord who last year lost their hives to some bears that all of a sudden appeared in Concord. Um, and it's, bears are difficult to deal with, as everybody knows. Um, what we tell people is you can put up a fence or an electrified fence on a solar system or however you wanna do it, um, but bears will walk right through an electric fence. Um, and the only thing that we have seen stop them is if you wrap the top of the fence with raw bacon. The bears go to bite the bacon and bite onto the wire and get a shock and disappear. But otherwise, they're almost impossible to stop. Um, I have friends in New Hampshire who were hit by bears so many times, they now put their hives on pallets that they created a pulley system that they raise them up in the air um, and secure them so that the bears can't get to them. Um, otherwise, there are no other, you know, predators in this, in the state that will really bother the, um, the hives. Deer ignore them. Um, the only other animal you really have to worry about is mice. Um, one of the things you learn if you take a bee school is that come the fall, you put what we call a mouse guard on the entrances to the hive. My, the mice want to go in and set up housekeeping inside the hive. One, because it's warm. Two, because there are, there's food. Um, and believe me, if you don't have a mouse guard, they will find it. Um, but otherwise, Again, except for teens or people who think it's funny, um, the predators are not a big issue. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, bees need water, as I said, so you need to create some sources of water. Um, a bird bath, a chicken watering bottle, even a dripping faucet, though that tends to be wasteful. Uh, simple things like taking an, a garbage can cover and filling it with rocks and putting it in front filled with water. Um, I do a hive at a school in Cam a private school in Cambridge with the kids uh, because the first graders and the fifth graders learn about pollinators and they have a community garden. One of the jobs the kids have is they have to make sure that the watering bottles or cans, we're actually using the clay pot bottoms, I forget what they're called, um, filled with rocks, they have to keep those filled because across the street from this school is a apartment complex that has a swimming pool. And if there's no water near the hives, they're gonna go to the swimming pool and we'll have complaints. Um, bees will drink the, the chlorinated water. It doesn't seem to bother them, okay? So 
You want dappled sunlight. You want an evergreen hedge to help block the winds. You want easy access. You need a water source and you want good drainage. You don't want moisture to collect underneath the hive. As I think I started to say earlier, the cold weather will not kill your bees. Obviously there are bees in Maine, there are bees in really cold parts of Russia. Um, what will kill your bees is moisture. And the bees generate a lot of moisture in the winter inside the hive through the process that they use to heat the hive. So you wanna make sure there's a good airflow through that hive to remove that vapor. If you don't, the bees, the moist, the vapor will collect on the top and it will rain inside your hive and you lose your bees. So it's the moisture that will cause the bees to die. Um, so making sure you're not in a kind of little dipped area where water collects will also help prevent that from happening. Um, Again, I, I mentioned that before, you wanna make sure the bees fly away from the neighbors um, and that you're pushing the bees up so that they're not flying into the sidewalks. You obviously wanna keep them away from top play areas since kids, even though you educate them, will start swatting and we don't want them getting stung. Um, this is such, just some examples of hives in different locations. Um, the other serious considerations are, do your members approve? Um, or do you have any member or families that have an allergic reaction to these things? Now, even if you do, I'm not saying you shouldn't do the program, but you should make sure they have um, their shots with them so that if they do get stung and that people know what to do. Um, Consider your neighbors first, ensure you have no reason to complain or be fearful of your bees. Again, education, education, education. You wanna keep general bees that, that exhibit a minimum of flight about the head. And if colonies tend to be defensive, there are approaches to basically requeen them and get them to be less offensive, okay? A lot of the bees, people are buying up here as packages are coming up from down south. Everybody has heard about Africanized bees, which have moved up from South America. Africanized bees are just tend to be more aggressive. Some people call them killer bees. They're not anybody who gets stung by a hundred bees is gonna be in trouble. Um, so I wouldn't call them killer bees and there are ways to deal with them. But some of the packages coming up, and some people think that the Africanized bees will not move up into our region because it's too cold. Some of I laugh at those people because I say, one, our climate's getting warmer, and two, I think they will adapt to our weather. Um, and it just means learning how to manage the bees differently and more securely. Um, and that really takes learning about bee biology and how to manage the bees, okay? Um, swarming, which everybody's heard about, is actually a good thing. It means your bees are doing very well. Swarming is basically the bees natural process that when they're overcrowded, when they're doing well and there's too many bees in the hive, it's their way of separating themselves and roughly 20 to 30% of the bees with the old queen will leave the hive and go try and find a new place to live. People get scared because they'll see, I don't know, 20, 30,000 bees flying in a black swarm um, and they think it's really dangerous. The reality is when bees swarm, they are less dangerous than if it's just a regular hive because they have stuffed themselves with honey and pollen because they know they're gonna need energy to create a new, to set up new housekeeping somewhere. So their bellies are full. They can't push their stingers out as easily, okay? 
A lot of beekeepers love catching swarms because usually they are bees that have overwintered over a season, so they're healthier. Um, and it's a free source of bees. Beekeepers tend to be cheap. They don't want to spend a lot of money. So if they can get bees for free instead of buying a new package, they will do it. Um, but again, it's educating the neighbors. I don't really care about swarming. So have I caught swarms? Yes. Do I have some of my hives at Drumlin that have swarmed on me? Yes. I don't always try and catch them because what it does is put more bees out into the wild. And that's part of my purpose of our beekeeping program out at the farm. This is just some bees on a sunflower. They love sunflowers. You want, again, keep an attractive water source nearby so that they're not gonna visit neighbor's pools. Um, I had a neighbor across the street from me that had kind of a water feature in their yard and the, some bees, and they weren't really, I don't think they were from my hive, but from another neighbor's hives were ending up in their yard, really bugging them. Um, and there are ways to deal with that. If you just put a little soap detergent, liquid soap detergent in the water of that water feature, it creates a tension on the top of the water so the bees can't get to it and they'll disappear looking for another place. At times you wanna conceal or camouflage your hives behind shrubbery or a fence or other kind of structure. Um, out of sight is out of mind and it's more so about kids roaming thinking they're gonna have fun. You only wanna inspect your colonies under optimum conditions and you wanna work quickly and efficiently. Um, again, most of the bees are out of the hive from mid morning to late afternoon. That's the time to go into your hive. You don't want to go do inspections early evening because basically everybody's home from their day of foraging. They don't want, you know, it's like you, you come home from work, you don't want to be bothered. You want to sit in your chair and have a wine or a beer or whatever. Um, and you don't want to be bothered for a while so you can decompress. Well, it's the same with the bees. If you go into your hive late afternoon or early evening, they are going to be really upset and let you know it. And the way they let you know it is they sting. Um, the first time I really ever got stung is we had, I had hives in the yard and we had friends visiting for dinner. And my wife said, oh, Lorraine wants to really see the bees. <clears throat> and I said, it's not a good time. She said, no, just quickly. And of course I went into the hive knowing I was pushing it and I got stung. Okay, because they were basically, it's their way of saying, hey, bozo, don't bother us this time of day. Okay. Um, there's a bee inside a flower um, collecting again, pollen and nectar. And you wanna make sure when you're managing your bees that you, you do it, you keep ahead of the bee so that if you're, um, if you're high, if your box of bees is getting full, you wanna add another box fairly quickly. That's part of the thing about managing your bees. Because if you don't, they're gonna feel overcrowded and they're gonna swarm. So there are ways to kind of prevent swarming. Um, but you would learn a lot about that in a bee school. I suggest people who are interested join local associations um, just because, you know, you get a lot of information as a group. It's just like any gardening group. There's a lot of information available. So these are just samples of locations of bees. Um, locations, again, this is just a summary. I'm going to jump through this. Another location is a hive with a lot of flowers nearby. And again, you want to do plantings besides your regular vegetables in your garden. You want to also make sure there's a lot of wildflowers and flowers that bloom over the whole season. Okay. Uh, 
This happens to be a hive at the school in Cambridge. There's a hive that we had, I had located at a assisted living uh, where they had a garden. And this one, you can see there are windows that people can look in and see the bees. So they're learning stuff, but also the garden did much better. And it was hidden from the street. You really couldn't see it. Again, you want to provide water sources. So that's just a bucket with water with uh, some rocks and some lily pads in there to give a place for the bees to land on. There's a little bird bath with rocks for the bees to stand on. There's a bee drinking the water. This is, happens to be called a Boardman feeder that's used to feed the bees early in the season. When it's really hot out, I will provide additional water um, for the bees using the Boardman. I also treat my bees naturally with some approaches where I make a mushroom tea mixed in with their water that kind of helps with viruses that the bees get. Again, here are some of the dishes filled with water. The chicken watering, another pail. You got to put floats in there so they have something to rest on, otherwise they drown. Here's a regular bird bath. This is just happens to be a garden forest that, that was leaking that I was at a friend's place one day and you can see the bees. Again, they'll find water where they need to find it. Oops. Just don't upset the neighbors. You also want to place your hive or hives with enough space around it so that you have a place to work. So this is a hive that's been at the, towards the middle of the season when it's been doing really well. And you can see there's a lattice fence that we started growing a vine on to block. Again, the, and that's that lattice starting to grow. Um, there are different hive stands. Again, as we talked earlier, it's important to get the hives off the ground, but there are a lot of options. You can build them. They sell metal stands, but this is a hive at a place where there are problems with bears. Um, and this is an electrified fence run off a solar panel. Um, and just as a final note to keep all your neighbors happy as you embark on keeping bees, good neighbor policy called honey um, works really well. Okay, these are just different types of hives. It's a community garden in Newton um, where I have a couple of students who now have placed hives there and a number of the people doing garden plots have said that they that their hives have done better. This is called a Slovenian hive and this is out at Gremlin. Um, and in Slovenia, one in three people, families are beekeepers. What's nice about this is normally there would be a whole series of these that they would mount in a garden shed and they can work them from the garden shed. We had, I built, had this, kiosk kind of built. The yellow is the hive itself. There are no boxes to lift. Um, and it's easier to work, especially for people who are getting older, like myself. This is just one of the experimental hives. Okay, so in earlier on, I talked about an, an, uh, a community garden agreement addendum. Again, I, I understand that most community gardens have liability agreements that people sign. This is an, an addendum to that to cover putting bees in. It's just one sample um, created by a group called beerooted.com. Um, save the bees, planting as much different stuff as possible. Um, and then these are just lists. Um, again, Anybody who's interested in learning to keep bees, every county group or most county groups run bee schools. 
Um, some of the community colleges have them. I know one up on the North Shore does. We run a B school through Mass Audubon. Again, now it's, uh, this is a list and their web address of all the different county B groups. Everybody's doing it online this year for obvious reasons. Um, hopefully after the, you know, later on in the season when things get better with the pandemic, people will be able to do field visits out to the hives. Um, Cause again, you learn a lot more out in the field. Here's one of the girls on a flower. And then these are just some different books that I recommend people use or read if they're interested. It also talks about, there's some books about types of plants for our region that are better for the bees. This is an announcement of our bee school at Mass Audubon, if you're interested. And that's it. All right. Wow. What? Thank you so much, Mel. What a informative and deep dive into honeybees and community gardens. I took away a lot of nuggets. I hope everyone was able to take notes and, and, and really dive into that information that Mel gave us. Um, we did put his contact information in the chat. And if you look at the chat, Rafi um, has added some wonderful links as we begin to wrap up. Um, before I go into those very quickly, are there any questions that we did not cover um, that folks may want to add as we come into these last six minutes of this beautiful workshop? Plus, the only thing I would add is if people have questions that come up later on, you're always welcome to email me. I generally get back to people fairly quickly. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you, thank you so much. So again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Have a great day.